Hello, and welcome to Engineering with Rosie Live. My guest, uh, John Paul Jack. So, uh, hi, John, and welcome also to you to Engineering with Rosie Live. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'll just give a quick uh, blurb or a. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, uh, let me just say um, today's live stream, we're going to talk, be talking about uh, levelized cost of energy. So, I hope uh, a lot of you watching watched the recent video that I did on the levelized cost of energy. It was an update for one that I did last year. Um, and for both of those videos, John did all of the calculations for me. He did the hard part. And you came up with the race car metaphor as well. So, basically, yeah, all of the good stuff. Um, and in the video we did last year, um, everyone commented that they wanted to see nuclear, 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 nuclear. Anytime you mention that word, there's always, you know, thousands of, of comments that uh, follow um, and also geothermal. And people wanted to know a little bit about subsidies and about um, energy storage um, and transmission associated with variable renewables. So the latest video combined all of that to come up with the cost of energy um, to compare between all those sources. Um, and in today's live stream, we're going to live uh, challenge some of those assumptions. So we've got a bunch of questions from YouTube and John is prepared to crunch the numbers uh, as we, yeah, as we, as we watch. Um, yes, so, this will be live crunching. Yeah. <laughs> so John, can you tell us about yourself and about key numbers, please? Thanks, Rosie. Uh, my name's John Poljak from Key Numbers. Uh, I developed a website called keynumbers.com where we just measure and um, basically look at numbers on a very simple level. So a lot of the times you're looking at like at engineering stuff from a finance perspective and vice versa. Um, we just try to keep it simple and all that. Um, and then for the levelized cost of uh, hydrogen talk today, uh, what we're going to do is, is that a lot of the times you get presented kind of um, just the numbers as is, but you want to play with the numbers. You know, what happens if the, co if the cap capital cost increases? What happens if the discount rate, or sorry, the interest rates uh, uh, increase? Those kind of questions. So today's talk, we're going to basically go through the standard model for Lazard, and then we're going to play with the numbers to see which one's going to be cheaper and under what assumptions. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. So um, okay, everyone sure. in the comments, get get your um, yeah get your questions ready. We've got some from YouTube, but also feel free to chime in. Um, I'm going to leave it mostly up to John, but I just first of all need to start by thanking the sponsor of these live streams, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, uh, WeatherGuard Make Strike Tape, which is a retrofitable lightning protection system for things that go fast, like wind turbine blades and aircrafts. These live streams would not happen without WeatherGuard support. So huge thank you to them. And then the other group that I need to always thank is um, the Engineering with Rosie Patreon community who support the whole channel. Um, and yeah, I really, really appreciate that. So cool. John, let's move on. Where do we want to start today? Um, uh, I'll just um, add in your screen so that you can okay. talk to that. Oh, whoops. That's not Ooh. what I wanted to show. Oh, yeah. That's it. Go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Let me make it a bit bigger so it's a bit easier to see for the people. Okay. Uh, just to kind of, um, we received, what we're going to do today is go through the comments uh, from YouTube. And then what I'm going to do is kind of like answer the questions as best I can. Um, the first question I had was um, from Neural Warp. Uh, as an engineering scientist with a background in metrics and measures, I can agree how hard it is to develop compound measures. Uh, every decision is subjective. Uh, and one of the things for our talk is today is, is that it's one thing to say that these are the Lazard numbers, but you might have your own interpretation of the numbers. So for example, we have uh, like a capital cost, like for example, um, there's a big project in America, the Volgatel, pro a Volgatel project, I think it's called, uh, which has currently got a sticker price of about $30 billion. So it looks really expensive. People are panicking whether it's going to produce cheap electricity or not. Um, and we can go with that number initially, uh, but also alternate, alternatively, we can also basically say, right, do you think it's going to get more expensive? So if you feel that it's going to get more expensive, just put a comment in in uh, in um, in the YouTube comments. Uh, Rosie will shout out, shout out to the comments and we can play with the numbers as is. 
Uh, one of the things also is, is that when we're talking numbers is that we're talking big numbers and we're trying to compare apples to apples effectively. So if we look at Lazard, they're also looking at the capital cost of electricity. So if we're constructing a power plant, they think in terms of dollars per kilowatt. So the very simple formula, uh, basically get the, the construction cost divided by the megawatt hours and you end up with like a cost here. So if we say like that for the nuclear project in America, they're saying $30 billion. So it works out to be $12,000 per kilowatt. Now, if we look at the Lazard numbers, sorry, I should have pulled out the Lazard numbers. Uh, Lazard had a high range of, sorry, a nuclear range of um, capital construction cost of about eight to $12,000. So we can see that this project's on the, on the high side. The other thing is also is that, and again, this is just a simple ex uh, exercise to explain just the, how the calculators work. Um, another thing is, is that a lot of the times we're looking at power. And in the previous video we did with, with uh, Rosie, we looked at basically switching from power to energy. So if we were to talk like one megawatt of electricity, how much, sorry, one megawatt of power, how much electricity do we get from that? Now, the way, very simple, one megawatt of electricity, if it was to run 100% of the time for a year, there's 8,760 8, hours per year, which means that we get 8,760. Now, imagine uh, it's a solar, solar panel, or sorry, solar farm. It might only have a capacity factor. It's only running at 23% of the time. So we're only getting 2,000 um, megawatt hours of electricity for that time. If we're talking nuclear, it might be running at 95% uh, at 8,322 megawatts and all that. The other thing is, is that the link, the, the project, how long does the uh, project, or sorry, the, the lifetime of the, of the power plant or the facility last for? If we're talking, for example, solar again, let's just go back to our 23%. One megawatt of solar farm would produce 40,000 megawatt hours of electricity over its lifetime. Whereas, and this was a big issue though on the questions that we had in the, the YouTube talk. Lazard assumes 20 years for their uh, project project length. Uh, so if we go back to like say 95% capacity factor, at 20 years, it's every one megawatt of a nuclear power plant is it going to produce 166,000 megawatt hours of electricity. But people are saying actually, a nuclear power plant lasts 40 40 years, in which case what one megawatt produces 332,000 megawatts. And other people are saying it's going to last 60 years. So, for example, that's going to be 60 years. So it's going to produce one megawatt of, of nuclear power could produce up to half a million megawatts of electricity over the lifetime of its asset. So theoretically... Can I jump in, oh, sorry. Can I jump in on um, wind as well? Because um, oh, sorry. Wind, wind, wind farms also, uh, their lifetimes are increasing. Um, I think I saw an article just a couple of weeks ago that there's been a wind farm sold with a service agreement for 35 years. So we always use 20 years as the assumption um, that you can push it out to 35 because we've got so many comments about nuclear's um, <laughs> lifetime is actually way longer. Nuclear's capacity factor is way higher. Um, and that, that is probably true, especially for certain projects. But um, I think all kinds of projects you can see the effect here, like the longer that you say that your project is going to last for, then the cheaper your cost of energy or the higher your profit is going to be. So that's a, a trick that um, everybody in all kinds of energy generation, power generation are, um, are onto. Correct. And if we look at our next slide, if we say here, for example, actually, let's take that wind example. We've produced 122,000 megawatts, uh, megawatt hours of electricity. Uh, if we come, what we'd have here, sorry, 122. So 122, uh, I think that's it. So you can see here, if we take just, and again, we're just looking at the construction cost. We're not looking at, for example, financing charges, fuel costs, et cetera. Uh, if we're just looking at the construction costs, um, again, a uh, wind turbine is not going to cost you 10,000. Maybe, um, let's say, I think Lazard had is like a, like say 1200. So if we're looking at the Lazard numbers, um, for an onshore, I think it was about 1200. Um, it's about 10 bucks a megawatt hour. So it looks ridiculously cheap at the moment, but again, we've got all the other cost to factor in. Whereas if you're talking like a nuclear power plant and we say 12,000, like let's take that 12,000 one. And sorry, I'm going to go back to find the, so we're going to say 95% capacity factor. Um, and we'll say nuclear is going to last for say 50 years. Just to say that, so we've got four hundred. We'll keep it. We'll keep it nice and simple. Four hundred 
thousand. So we can see here just the construction cost alone. Uh, at even the, the the very expensive nuclear power plant in America is still going to be thirty dollars. So problem solved. We all go nuclear. It's really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what a lot of uh, a lot of commenters would like us to conclude. Um, I don't know. I, I might have missed you mentioning it, but this is is this public on the key numbers site? Can people head? It is. And... Um, uh, I've uh, you have to register to get in. It's free. Uh, the previous video was also. We did a previous one as well, which is also uh, free. Um, I, I have to let you in for the time being, but after the video, after the video, after this live stream is complete, you can kind of connect up and and. Go in there and sign it. But yeah, just uh, play around with the assumptions. And yeah, you can play around with the assumptions and all that. Get whatever result that you want if you, uh, yeah, if you play loose and fast with the with the assumptions. Exactly. Um, so the second question that we had was uh, from NC three eight two six. One of the issues was is that you know how how accurate were the Lazard numbers? Um, were they kind of reasonable compared to actual real world projects? So what I've done is, is that like if I looked here on the in terms of the capital cost, Lazard had about twelve and a bit thousand for their high estimate, and then for their low estimate, they had close to eight thousand dollars per kilowatt. Now you can imagine that's a thirty thirty billion uh, dollars divided by the by the quant by the um, the nameplate capacity, and away we go. We can see here the USA project is actually very close to the high side. Um, the French project I thought was cheap. <laughs> And then one LinkedIn, someone pointed out that I had an estimate of about, what was it, um, 12 or $13 billion, and it ended up being $21 billion. So I've put someone else's kind of like estimate of the French project. And this is the one that's had quite a lot of um, technical delays. I think they've been basically trying to build it for the last 16 years. Um, if, we look okay. at Hinkley, if we look at Hinkley, which is, um, um, uh, it looks like it's kind of on the low side, but again, in the nuclear industry, it's, costs are very opaque, and I'll explain why. Sometimes we, you know, we have to take like quite a broad range when we're looking at like the the costs. Uh, yeah. Alternatively, um, we also got, for example, the um, the Baraka project in the United Arab Emirates, and in China, the Tashin, which is quite cheap as well. But again. Um, one of the just a couple of things that, like the pinch of salt on this side of things um if we're looking at projects in say france and england and europe one of the things is that we're, we're doing everything in us dollars and their, their exchange rates have pretty much collapsed in the last year or two so that's one area that we have to watch out for is like when i was doing a lot of these pro like costings for like say um say uk the rate might have been 1.4 to the dollar or 1.5 to the dollar now it's sitting at about 1.2 so straight away, if you want to if you want a cheap nuclear project, just basically price it in US dollars at the moment and plonk it in Europe. So it's uh, so you got to watch out for that kind of stuff. Um, also, things like in China and say the Emirates, um, we don't have access to publicly listed financial statements. So it could these are just a lot of the times kind of estimates based on um, you know media announcements and stuff. But that's okay. roughly what the, just... yeah. Um... Mm -hmm. That's that's good about the assumptions of the cost. Have you got something similar for capacity factors? Because we've got a few comments about that. So um, I don't know. Uh, oh, pull okay. you out of order, but we've got from no, no, that's um, okay. Eskil Eriksson, old nuclear, <laughs> old nuclear power plants don't or doesn't run ninety five percent of the time. Far from it. Um, and then um, Trebaka says nuclear in France can't run at full power due to cooling water being too warm. So and I know um, I. I mentioned in the video that I think France over the last year was at about 60% capacity factor. I even saw someone tweet that it was down to nearly 50% once the year was fully over. Um, but then, you know, so many people commented that nuclear's capacity factor should be, um, you know, higher. Um, do you have uh, I found, um, I've got the numbers for America, which is coming from the EIA, their environmental, sorry, uh, energy information agency. Um, if I'm looking at nuclear, they're quite high still. Um, like, you know, back in 2012, they're 86%, but they're kind of coming up to 92% at the moment. Coal has been the one which has been, um, Coal is a disaster in America. So if you're looking at, for example, you know, they should be up around 80%, but they're down to 49% in 2021. So um, 
in terms and of it's natural in Australia too, right? Coal capacity factors Correct. Are, are dropping because, um, well, a lot of people actually, I remember quite a few people in the comments saying that it's because mm -hmm. it's not fair that, um, you know, they preferentially use wind and solar and that might be true in some places, but I, I know in Australia it's preferential in the, in the sense that they use the cheapest ones first and wind and solar are cheaper um, or, you know, they're bidding cheaper into the market. So um, Correct. I don't think that's really preferential treatment that you go with the lowest cost um, supplier. But it is definitely true that coal, like technologically, coal's capacity factor could be much higher. Um, and it used to be when, you know, the whole energy system was based around just using your coal pretty much flat out and, you know, even encouraging people to change their behavior to match a coal generator more, um, you know, so yep. like off, -peak, off peak water heaters and stuff like that. Um, and now that we've got a lot of solar in the middle of the day and prices are low, maybe negative, then coal is being forced to, you know, um, change in some way and capacity factors are lower. But um, yeah, yeah it's, um, it's actually, I can, I can bring up another point of why capacity factors for coal is very low. And um, if we look at, sorry, I've just gone to a little simple calculator. Sorry, make that a bit smaller. Um, okay. This is just like uh, using the CSIRO gen cost reports. Um, I won't get into the details. The main one to realize is this one here. So if we're looking at like say um, the coal price in US dollars, um, it was a hundred, I'm using world, I, um, I'll kind of call out a few things because people are very, usually kind of interested in where, where I'm getting the information from. Uh, World Bank has a commodity prices monthly report called Pink Sheets, and you can find out what the latest prices are of things like Brent crude, uh, Australian Newcastle coal, etc. So if we're talking, for example, um, Newcastle coal, I think it like in December, it was about $380 or something, it's something crazy. So if you're talking like, what would that be for the cost of electricity? You're talking electric, if you were to buy coal at the spot price, you're talking about $350 a megawatt hour if you were to run it through an Australian generator, like a new, like say coal, coal fired generator in Australia. Now, of course, what happens is, is that a lot of the times um, coal is uh, locked into a specific generator. You know, they haven't put um, rail lines to go and get it out of the country or anything. But you're talking like electricity costs, you know, if, if, if solar and wind are about 30 to $50 a megawatt hour, you're talking the coal being like, you know, five to six times higher than those prices. People are just mm -hmm. going to switch off and not bother. So it's not like, um, yeah. uh, it's, it's difficult to, yeah, it's difficult to, um, um, justify coal at that at the time being. Yeah. So okay. let me just um, ask this question from uh, Slati Bart fast. Uh, how do you anticipate the reduction in capacity factors due to increasing renewables would affect nuclear and coal in the next 20 years? And I think we see that happening in Australia. Coal plants are, are closing before the end of their um, expected lifetime um, because they, yeah, the capacity factor drops and then, yeah, fuel fuel costs are high. It, it, it's just they're losing money to operate and, you know, like mm -hmm. every, every, couple, every couple of months we get another announcement in Australia about a coal power plant that's bringing forward its end of end of life um, we don't have nuclear here so we we can't say that but i do think australia is kind of um i don't know the canary in the coal mine <laughs> coal um, power plants because we've got so much variable renewables and the rest of the world will we'll get there um I, yeah I, I i can jump around a bit and then say like um and again i was going to look at the storage um Without doing a massive spreadsheet or kind of analysis myself, the best option, like David Osmond, and he was on your show previously, uh, he did yeah. the 100% renewables Twitter thread. And then all he's saying is effectively saying, uh, take the existing generation, scale it up for 60% wind, 25% rooftop and 20% solar, five gigawatts of battery plus existing hydropower. And like he's getting numbers of like 98%. Now, of course, he's like, you know, no. 99%. So yeah, you take it with a pinch of salt. Because, sorry, there's a, like, you got, you know, it's a, it's a ballpark number still. You, you, you'd hope you, what you do is go to the next level and ask a, um, uh, like an engineering house to optimize that or like an AUMO kind of organization. Um, so that would be the, so in Australia, you, you, you don't really, you know, you, what you'll see is, um, uh, the potential for a lot of renewables, um, and, 
I'm just the bean counter, so I'm not going <laughs> to ask about the engineering side of things. I'm sure there's a lot of things like around the the technical challenges of um, doing that much uh, renewables. But you assume that you know there's some smart people there and they'll get onto it. Um, what you'll end up seeing is is that like renewables will will do the heavy lifting, and then there'll be a whole bunch of peaker plants or some sort of natural gas kind of like in Australia anyway that would kind of like um, plug the gaps on those kind of cloudy um, less less windy days, which hopefully shouldn't be too many. So that's all. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's, Could let's I... go back to your, your planned order. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry yeah. <laughs> Keep on pulling you away. Uh, actually, can we just, well, just, I can touch on that just a little bit more. Um, I, again, kind of, uh, that's, the, so if anyone wants to just go to, just look for David Osmond on Twitter and you can kind of check it out and he's got a pretty good kind of like graphs for that side of things. Um, a while back, and again, take this with a big pinch of salt because this is just me kind of playing around with, with data sets. Um, I looked at the UK energy mix as well. Now, one of the areas that, you know, you'll see the graph, which is kind of, you know, like, you know, it'll go up and down as like, you know, as people need electricity throughout the day. And then there'll be like wind periods and um, that'll be, you know, like very windy and lack of wind. So what I did was I took a year's worth of data from um, the UK and I looked at the actual wind generation. Now, one thing with the UK is, is that they don't really have um, uh, solar. It's 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 the UK. They don't solar is not really kind of um, an efficient solution for them. So most of it's onshore or offshore wind. What I then did was I said, okay, let's hypothet. Now I think they took they they're about twenty percent of their energy is coming from electricity. So all I just did on the graph was say, okay, let's put the sunny wind, the, the very windy, the windy hours on the left hand side. And then the um, the lack of windy days or the you know the non windy days on hours on the right hand side. So what you get is kind of a graph, and this orange line represents how wind wind works in the UK. So you got these are the so on hour eight eight thousand six hundred forty one. So towards the end of December, it was it was oh sorry, um, that's not that hour. These are the hours where it's basically you don't have enough wind, and these are the hours where you get like a heap of it. Then in theory, what you got to do is kind of like basically double the size of wind. So just like, you know, just, you know, two exit or three exit, and then just get that red line above, above what you need in terms of generation. Now, again, I'm not playing with batteries or anything like that, but I just did a quick calculation in terms of like saying, okay, what happens to wind, you know, the one X, uh, again, this is a combination of onshore and offshore. So apologies for that. So that's why the EP cost looks a bit low, but again, don't worry about the numbers themselves, but just the, the, the cost escalation. So if you were to go, right, we've got 20% of wind in, in the UK, we've got, a, it's going to be about 60 quid um, a megawatt hour. We can double that. It's still roughly the same price, triple it. You're still good. Four times. You're still good. As soon as you go past 5x and 6x, your costs go up through the roof. Sorry, so I'll just kind of like explain. Oh, sorry if, if you can, if that's easy to see. So, so we've gone from like say um, um, uh, 60 60 pounds a megawatt hour, and as soon as you get up to like say 6x or 8x, you're getting up to like 400. Oh, sorry, if I look at the numbers, 90. You go from 90 pounds a megawatt hour. Um, as soon as you go to 6x, it's about 274 mega, uh, pounds of megawatt hour. And then double that it became, because as you're increasing your um, uh, wind generation, um, every all the extra wind generators are basically there's less less capacity factor for the for the last couple for the, for the, for the less and less. So what you're going to find is is that um, in the UK and most probably Europe. Um, it won't be as easy to do renewables as say Australia. So they may have to look at other solutions such as for example, the long cable from um, Morocco, like the, 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 the um, um, what they're called, um, uh, the, the, I think the direct current, the high voltage, high voltage direct current lines coming in from say Morocco to, to supplement what the renewables are in, in Europe. Um, so sorry, just, I was just go off on the tangent and all that anyway. So, um, so let's go back to our uh, capital cost. Um, one thing that um, uh, we had a question from H. A. Hubsy. I forgot. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's um, so funny trying to read out usernames. <laughs> actually, I'm surprised that um, YouTube doesn't put the actual. You can actually see the name if you click on the link. You can see their actual name. But anyway, that's that's uh, oh, really? YouTube for you. Huh. Uh, so he was saying that. Oh, sorry, that person was saying that. Um, uh, you know, there's all delays on 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 nuclear projects. So, for example, a three to four year delay. 
Uh, one of the interesting things with nuclear is, is that, um, let's say it's a 10 year project. A lot of the times they're getting soft loans from the governments, especially if they're kind of, you know, like um, it's a French nuclear plant in China or say um, a Chinese plant in say the Middle East or Pac I think they were doing one in Pakistan. So a lot of the times they're giving them soft loans and favorable loans to during the construction period. So imagine a project that's just a very simple chart. Um, and I'm just using an S-curve here. So um, to explain for the audience what an S-curve is, is that during construction project, you're not really doing too much at the beginning. There's a lot of say like, you know, paperwork, engineering and design. Then you're ramping it up as you're building it. And then towards the end, it slows down in terms of production, in terms of, sorry, um, you know, you, you're fine tuning things as during the commissioning period. Again, that's my non-engineering view of an S-curve. Um, so if, we, if we're looking here, like say, like um, um, a project that lasts 10 years, you might be looking at just a simple 3% interest rate. You're gonna pay about a billion dollars in interest um, during, during the project. So in terms of your analogy, just to get to the starting line, it's not a $10 billion project anymore. The starting line for nuclear is now an $11 billion project. So that means that basically the capital, the, the effectively the levelized cost of electricity goes up. Now the question becomes that what happens if you were to kind of like do it at commercial rates and the project got delayed by an extra five years? That ten that ten billion dollar project now becomes a sixteen billion dollar project very quickly, uh, and that's a big problem because suddenly, like you know, um, you know, it's not just being at the starting line. You're at the starting line, and now you've got like an extra sixty percent worth of cost that you have to recover throughout the life of the project. Uh, and this is a real challenge for like, say, um, uh, this is why you see a lot of like nuclear projects being kind of like intertwined with political requirement because it, it requires cheap government debt to kind of get them over the line. Uh, so that's just to, just to be aware of that. Okay. Um, another area just in terms of um, the, uh, sorry for this from Philip Vecchio. Um, you know, he was kind of commenting that that the projects were like a Swiss watch, very individual and custom, which means that they're very expensive to kind of build. So a lot of the, the, the talk at the moment is around kind of like, how do we provide like a cookie cutter approach? And you're seeing kind of like a, a lot of stuff trending around say small modular reactors. So the, the concept is, is that you can build everything in a factory, pull it into, a, you know, like um, make it small enough that it will kind of like uh, fit in a factory and kind of be transportable and then away it goes. Now, one thing with the small uh, modular reactors is that a lot of the times, apart from you've got small modular reactors on say nuclear warships, they're actually you know, technically been done for quite a while, but to put them in say a commercial environment, they're still under the light they're being licensed and kind of uh, still on the drawing board. So you have a company, for example, NewScale, which is building like, say, a small modular reactor. Uh, and they've assumed that, I think it was like, so they've got here a number of uh, $5,000 a kilowatt. So let's plug in 5,000 and see what we end up with. So they're assuming that, and again, I'm just, oh, sorry, my fault. I just pressed the wrong button. Um, Let me just, just jump in to um, mention that I did a video on new scale. I interv interviewed um, Dr. Jose Reyes from there. So if you want to know a lot more about the uh, details of new scale, then you can check out that video on my channel. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I usually get a lot of ideas from your videos. So that's a lot of the times I'm kind of oh, uh, pulling out numbers and um, doing kind of infographics. Uh, so if we have, for example, here, the new scale modular reactor, they were kind of estimating it at, at, at say $3.6 billion for a 720 megawatt plant, basically $5,000 a, a kilowatt. Now, uh, I looked at a quick article from PowerMag and they were saying, oh, it's actually about $6,000, $6 billion. So if we were to kind of just plug in, let's say, for example, $9,000, we've gone from $80 a megawatt hour to about $122 a megawatt hour. So uh, now one of the, we have to also worry that this is a first of a kind. Um, so, the, you know, we're expecting these costs to go up uh, initially and then eventually the project, the, the costs will come down long term. Um, but one thing that we, we should also factor in is, for example, um, looking at projects around the around the world, um, I came across the South Korean plant, which was kind of like um, the Shin Hanul project, uh, which they've said it's about $6 billion or 4,400. Now, again, if I put in 4,500, these are very opaque numbers. I get a reasonable price of electricity coming from nuclear. Um, now what they've done to basically reduce the cost is that they've built four nuclear, basically I think it was like four nuclear um, 
reactors next to each other. So they've built the pads, so they've, you know, the construct, you know, the whole area of facility. So now they're just doing cookie cutter and putting them one after the other. So by the time they get to that fourth one, hopefully it's a lot cheaper than the first one. Um, and then they can kind of like share infrastructure, et cetera. So that's something that needs to be thought about in terms of like for nuclear is like well-designed and well-planned kind of like uh, facilities and also looking at the big scheme of things, what, you know, like uh, the whole the whole system effectively. Okay. Um, nuclear duration. Um, oh, this is a... <laughs> Uh, this is an area, as you mentioned, like in our first kind of like, like kind of calculation, um, if let's assume that you can build the plant, you know, for, instead of being a 20 year plant, you can build for 40 or 60. That means you've got a lot more uh, electricity. So you can divide that those initial costs uh, across a lot more electricity. Um, and we can see here, for example, uh, okay, so in theory, it should be um, let me just kind of like zero out all the other costs to kind of give you an idea of what the, what the, okay, I'm just getting rid of the maintenance and then we'll just say it's, uh, that's fine. Okay. So here, for example, if I just take the, I'm oh, sorry, let's we'll start with 20. Okay. So this is a very expensive plan. I'll just put it at 150, uh, over 20 years worth of fuel. Um, oops, sorry, my fault. Zero point. Um, you can see here, for example, um, I've got it's going to cost me uh, ninety dollars per megawatt. So if I drop it by forty, uh, sorry, increase it by forty years, effectively my average cost, per, my average unit cost of electricity comes down to fifty. Okay, so everything's fantastic. Um, so that's one benefit of kind of like a longer longer duration. The one problem that people forget about is that. Um, these projects are being financed by investors. So what an investor is going to look for, let's say, for example, investor wants 7%, that investor is not going to just want, in, um, um, uh, they're not going to want um, a return for 20 years. They're going to want a return over the full life of the project. So if you increase the number of years, you're also increasing the amount of investor return that they're expecting. So effectively, that increases the cost of the um, cost per megawatt hour. The other thing is also is, is that the last 20 years of the project, um, in financing terms, we discount those. So just like, you know, um, uh, the marshmallow test, one marshmallow now is worth, uh, sorry, one marshmallow now and you get two marshmallows in the future, you know, are you willing to wait around? Um, you willing to, oh, sorry, maybe a bad example. Um, what that means is, is that if we look here, like at a dis, um, $100, if we discount that over 40 years, for example, um, Let's say, for example, our revenue, revenues in, oops, sorry, uh, revenue in the first year, if you got your revenue today as, as $100, $100, but if you discounted it at, say, at, uh, say 7%, that revenue in 40 years' time is only worth about $10. So a lot of the times, our future revenues and our future costs are not very, uh, they basically, finance people will not actually um, take that into consideration. They're not considered material for the for decision making. Can I just ask you a question a... about that curve? So it's like it, um, $100 if you get it today is worth $100. But if you have the promise of $100 in 40 years, then it's only worth like 10 or uh, what $35, depending on what your discount Cor rate is. Is that what that correct. curve is saying? Yeah, so the more it's discounted, the more it's le the less it's worth in the future. So if you can flip it around the other way, think of it the other way also is, is that if you put $10 in the bank now and you, um, if you put $10 in the bank now at 7% return, you'll get $100 in 40 years time. Or if you put $10 in the bank now and in, in three, at 3%, you might only get say 30 or five, whatever the number is, $50 in, the, in 40 years time. So the discount rate is kind of like the, the flip side of putting your money in the bank and getting a lot more out later on. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, and just the, on the financing side of things, just in terms of that 7% versus 3%, um, if we look at the Lazard parameters, they, they're assuming that um, uh, an investor return, well, the investor return is 12%, debt rate is 8%. Uh, you get a benefit for taxes as well. So what Lazard is assuming is that 
um, because you're depreciating the asset and you get it, you get it, you might make losses in the first year, first few years of the project. Uh, you get a tax, but you avoid paying taxes. So they consider that a benefit to the project. So you avoid paying taxes somewhere else in your group. So imagine you've got, you know, Rosie Nuclear Incorporated and Rosie Wind Incorporated. Uh, Rosie Wind Incorporated is making lots of money, but has to pay 30, 40% in taxes. Now you offset that against Rosie Nuclear, which is making losses. You're effectively saving money in Rosie Wind, and that's actually considered a benefit for financial uh, under a finance model. So. Okay, not a subsidy, but just the fact that I'm spending money. So correct. It's, so uh, my profits less. Yeah. So if you, it's yeah. more just the case of like if you look at it from it. It, it seems funny that you you have to you have to give the investors twelve percent. The uh, you have to give the bondholders eight percent, but the forty percent return. Uh, sorry, but your but your average average cost of capital is seven point seven. So that's where the forty percent mm. kind of comes into it. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I'm not so much interested in the accounting usually. <laughs> let's, let's not oh. spend too much time, time. No, on that's, that, it's just, it's just something just to be aware of the, the, the it's more just the, the technical thing on the assumptions. Uh, I think what's yeah. more important is, is like understanding where the, um, how much of the, the soft loans are there. I'm oh, sorry, I shouldn't have put Columbia University for the US department. Um, one thing to be aware of is that um, that's the that's a commercial investor's return. So that's what they're going to look for if they were to build a nuclear plant, plant privately. But what you're seeing, for example, um, oh, sorry, apologies, that shouldn't be Columbia University. That should be, that, uh, no for example, didn't oh, say. sorry. <laughs> I've been quickly hacking things together today. Um, the U.S. Department of Energy's got a uh, loans program, which is Jigasha. So if you ever hear Jigasha and he's, you know, hustling people to kind of build things in America, he's doing it with cheap debt. Now, what they basically uh, under the uh, loans program, what they say is, is that you got access to government debt. Uh, sorry, at government rates, which might be like, I think it's treasury rates are about 3%. And then they're going to add a small margin, either between 0.375% to 2% above the treasury rate. So they could provide a very cheap loan. So your project can become profitable and they're very much pushing the, the nuclear project. So that uh, Vogtel project in um, Georgia in America, that's got a massive loan from the, from the American government. Um, the other options is that you can see, for example, um, uh, Chinese, the Chinese, they're providing loans for, to like, for example, the Pakistan project. So there's a Pakistan nuclear project anywhere between one and 6% uh, is the loan rate. And if you're willing to deal with the Russians, you can get 3%. So, uh, you can, but you take the risk and there's a good Columbia, uh, university report on, uh, on the finance rates that, um, yeah, the finance rate. Sorry, the finance rates that are used across nuclear, and I'll add the the link into the into the key numbers and all that. Okay, and just to give an example of where that could give you, again, these are loans for like usually the construction period. But if we kind of take something similar, if we go from seven point seven percent to three percent, we can see that we've dropped our um, nuclear um, costs from one hundred and sixty dollars to ninety dollars. So it's a massive it's it's a massive um, uh, change in the in the um, Hmm. in the economics okay and, and these would i are be the... right to assume that mm -hmm. uh would i be right to assume that a, like a brand new unproven technology investors would require a, a greater return so you know, correct a few comments about some new geothermal um drilling techniques and um one uh, one about wave energy as well um i think the question about wave energy i think was why why isn't it um, on there and uh, a lot of people asked a lot, asked that question about a lot of different technologies and I mean if you haven't got existing projects to get numbers from you can't do anything more than make a you know like a wish list for what you wish your LCOE was so I don't think you could like all of the the ones that you've um, compared, it's, it's based on real project data right it's not just correct. estimates of what they hope no. to cost these are these are these are kind of coming from like uh, the University of Columbia is kind of going through and asking like actual like nuclear projects. If we take that small modular reactor as a good example, let's say the return is seven percent. Now let's say that we don't know if SMR is going to work properly or whether they can get their money back. Let's say an investor and it's one hundred and fifty dollars a megawatt hour. Let's say the investor goes, I actually really want fifteen percent. That's going to drop it up. That's going to increase it to $275 a megawatt hour. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg in that they have to kind of reduce the, 
they have to do the projects to kind of get the the cost down so that the investors will invest at a reasonable rate so then they, they, they can prove their technology. And this is where government comes into it to kind of like justify, like kind of, you know, uh, um, a lot of R&D is done by government as opposed to private sector. Uh, there's actually a rule of thumb, which is, um, I'll try to find it a bit later, but um, if you're talking private equity, so these are the kind of, you know, real gambling money. Um, there's, a, there's a simple rule, which is uh, a private equity, so let's say a venture capitalist, they're expecting to kind of like, it's the rule of threes. Uh, a third of their money is wasted. They just write it off. A third of their money is kind of like, um, uh, a third of their money is kind of, you know, like it breaks even. So that last third of the projects, so this is, we're talking the Googles and the Twitters and all the, all the kind of, you know, like uh, the unicorns, they're expecting you know, a seven and a half, a seven and a half X return from their investments. So imagine if you've invested, like, you know, you're, you're a, um, a new scale and you've invested $100 million. The, the equity people, the venture capitalists are going to look for like 1.7 billion or something like that. So, you know, as a return. So they're going to look for multiples. And that's why, like, if you're talking like these kind of like um, energy projects, they're very difficult to, to fund because like with software, it's, you know, a couple of programmers and you have very limited, you know, capital costs. These are massive projects that involve a lot of, you know, I'm sure the same issue is the same in wind and solar initially. So that's the, the challenges there. Mm. Um, uh, capacity factor. Uh, I'll try to find some European numbers. Sorry, I was in a bit of a rush, so I just pulled out the US, the US ones. Um, in terms of decommissioning costs, uh, that was another question. So we had a heap of questions on this one. Um, I won't go through all the details, but you know, um, Lazard doesn't take into account the decommissioning costs. So they basically just go, we don't care. And one of the reasons is, is that if we look back in our financing, I think we look at our little kind of cut, uh, let's say for example, we've got um, $100 of decommissioning costs. You'll actually, for the, in terms of the consequences of the project, it's mostly worth only ten dollars to the project. So it's not like so because it's so far in the future, it basically is such a minimal cost. Now we have to. Um, there's one other part of the, the the discounted cash flow that needs to be taken into account. Yes, we have a cost that you know it might be a hundred dollars today, that we think is you know we only, we only value it at like ten dollars in the future, but you're assuming that your future profits are going to pay for that ten dollars. So eventually, as it gets to forty years, it comes back up to hundred. So if you don't make profits, you're not really going to fund your um, future liabilities or your future decommissioning costs. And this is a bit of a, um, if I go off on a bit of a tangent, you see a lot of, say, um, fossil fuel companies going bankrupt and suddenly, you know, they haven't funded the liabilities of their decommissioning. And then suddenly, you know, the government has to pick up the tab and that's happening throughout the world. Uh, yeah, so if I we... think that that um, what you said there about, oh, you know, because it's so far in the future, it's value today is practically nothing. That's an argument. I think that it only an accountant and obviously not all accountants, <laughs> if you don't think so, only an accountant could be satisfied by that. I think that the general public think that's such a, a cop out and there's lots of people commenting at, in the comments about that. But um, yeah, yeah and, and that's um, I'm not I'm not. I'm not advocating. I'm just kind of explaining how how the how the say financial decision making yeah. would 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 um, occur. There was an issue in terms of which discount rate to apply. So as if you apply a higher discount rate, your future decommissioning costs come down a lot. Um, again, I'm a bit kind of uh, not close to that subject, but there was a kind of hoo ha amongst all the uh, energy companies, and they agreed to use a lower discount rate. So they've agreed to kind of like provide a bit more funding for future decommissioning costs. Your big companies like BP and Shell will be fine. They'll they'll eventually clean up their their stuff. The problem is is that the smaller companies they're the ones that you have to watch out for. So that's the that's the issue. Okay. Mm. Uh, sorry, and just to explain, um, decommissioning costs. I've struggled again. Nicola's not quite my. I just crunched the numbers. I don't really kind of not an expert exactly in these fields. Um, the just simple rule of thumb, which is uh, anywhere between nine and fifteen percent of the initial capital cost. So if you're talking a project that's worth say um, say twenty billion dollars, then they'd have to allocate about three billion dollars for decommissioning, as, if that, as a general rule. But again, forty years into the future. 
Yeah, I'm not an expert on nuclear either, um, so mm -hmm. I, I don't even know the answer if you know how many examples there are of nuclear power plants that have actually been decommissioned. I guess not not many since you know the boom in nuclear was around the 70s, and yeah, that's yeah, uh, what, 50 years ago. Definitely, and there was the the golden age of nuclear was is that was like say the 1980s was when, when there were a lot of them were commissioned. So if you're talking like they built they got built in the say 60s and 70s or 70s, commissioned in the 80s, and then uh, um, they've been running for the last say 30 to 40 years. So that's the but again now now the chickens are coming out to roost, and you know put, solutions have to be found for that kind of stuff. Uh, and nuclear waste storage, uh, that was another area we had a few comments on um, the cost of nuclear waste storage. Um, this is a tough one because there's no real full solution. So, for example, in America, um, I think they built a big facility in um, Nevada to kind of like store all the nuclear, like the long term nuclear waste. But it's been it's been in the courts and, the, you know, being thrown about between government and federal and state to kind of argue whether it's going to be used or not. So a lot of the times they spent the a lot of, like a lot of this nuclear waste is just kind of sitting around trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, um, I did come across a, a, a little comment from the World Nuclear uh, Organization. In the big scheme of things, it's actually, you know, as a percentage of the total cost, uh, they're talking, it's not, you know, we're talking, for example, um, the $26 billion US, US used fuel program is funded by a 0.1 or like a 0.1% per kilowatt hour levy. So it's not a very big levy, but of course, as they're producing a lot of product, like a, um, um, a lot of um, electricity, it adds up to quite a bit over time. So, but again, again, um, finance has its limitations. We only talk in terms of twenty or 40 year, forty year time horizons. How you're going to account for things over, like say, thousands of years, uh, is a is a tough one. So that's a that's mm. a that's a tough one as well. Um, and we got a few more on nuclear accidents as well. So again, if you look at the statistics, nuclear is relatively uh, safe across the board, but when they have an accident, it's a big accident. <laughs> so the big ones were unfortunately um, Fukushima, uh, Chernobyl and the Three Mile Island one. But apart from that, and there was a few smaller ones as well. So that was, uh, uh, and the I think this is coming from Three Mile Island. Um, we're talking like a, it took them 12 years and a billion dollars to kind of clean up that mess. So. We'll clean up that 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 side of things. Mm. Okay, uh, so that kind of covers nuclear. Um, what have we got after that? I was surprised. I was expecting a lot of questions on nuclear and geothermal, but, but people were very interested in say uh, subsidies and systems mm. uh, system costs, and we'll get through to that as well. Um, subsidies and storage. <laughs> the, yeah, subsidies is a massive. Um, topic um, a lot of it is price support in especially developing in third world countries um, without kind of again I just kind of scratched the surface and there was there was a heap of it there um, we've got a question from Equilux um, uh, ex, I, I won't get in uh, I did find for example um, I think it was a night who was this I think it was OECD just had like a little graphic between fossil fuel support by energy product um, and again this is just like waving the flag for key numbers. And again, just conceptually, um, if we put big numbers out there, it's very difficult to, um, um, you know, it's just a big number. So it's just, you know, so what I just quickly did, I said, okay, you're saying that there's about, I think it was like $700 billion in subsidies in 2021. Okay, from a, sim from a very simple point of view. Sorry, I can hear something in the background. I'm just wondering, sorry, if you apologize, I'm just going to... I can't hear, so I don't know oh, if okay. uh, anybody else is hearing it, but I don't okay. think it's... Okay, sorry, it might be just... Okay, I'm just worried I've got something voice. running in the background. Um, so what I just did was, this is very simple, and again, back of the envelope calculation. I went through the BP statistical guide, and I said, well, how much oil is produced per year? 32 million barrels, uh, sorry, 32 billion barrels per year. Um, Gas, how much gas is produced? I think it's 145 exajoules. And um, uh, I think it was like 7 billion tons of coal per year. I mean, this is just phenomenal numbers. And just using a quick average historical price, you know, we're talking, I think the, the, the value of oil, gas, and coal is about 3.8 billion, sorry, $3.8 trillion. 
Now, even that subsidy of seven hundred million dollars, seven hundred billion dollars, you're talking again simple calculation. It's just the twenty percent subsidy. But again, that's the wholesale price of um, energy. By the time it comes to the consumer, it's most for your subsidy of about five to ten percent. So, is it a big thing? Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure I could do the similar numbers. I mean, there's a heap of reports on the, from the mining from the mining lobby, where they've gone, oh, you know, renewable energy's got heaps of like you know, for, you know subsidies, and you know everyone's funding them. But I'm sure in the big scheme of things, the renewable energy subsidies and fossil fuel would be like five to ten percent in terms of your total cost. So if I was to remove, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if I was to remove those subsidies, I'd most receive my retail price of electricity uh, or energy would go up by about 10%. So that would be, so is it a big thing? Uh, I'll leave it to the audience to kind of uh, decide that. Um, uh, carbon tax. Um, so uh, the question was from Music Cassette with a K. Uh, is the cost of emitted CO2 included in the fossil fuel? Um, no, in the Lazard report. Um, what's the impact of that? So um, just to give a couple of numbers on this one, coal emissions, um, as a general rule, uh, for every kilowatt hour of electricity, um, you emit one kilo of CO2. Uh, if it's from natural gas, uh, one kilowatt of electricity produces about 400 grams of of, of CO2. Again, that's just the direct emissions. You might want, well, you know, some people would argue the toss about including indirect and uh, fugitive emissions on that side of things. So if I was to say, right, okay, what would a carbon tax do to the cost of um, coal? If I was to, very simple, you know, $100 a ton carbon tax would increase my electricity bill by it to $100 a megawatt hour or like, you know, 10 cents, 10 cents a megawatt hour. So that would just be the, the relatively simple. Um, and you can incorporate that in terms of the, I think at the moment, one of the big issues is that because fuel prices are so high, um, the fossil fuels are much more expensive than renewables. So carbon taxes are not really, it's, um, you know, they would make it even more expensive, but the job's already been done by, unfortunately, Vladimir Putin, by kind of like, you know, um, going, going to war and, uh, you know, watching prices go through the roof. In the future, get my video video flagged if you keep on talking. Oh, sorry, about sorry, sorry, like sorry, sorry, sorry. YouTube, uh, yeah, YouTube doesn't doesn't like it when you mention words like that, no matter how. Oh, sorry, my fault, my fault. About it. <laughs> sorry. No, 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 it's fine. I don't want to censor you. I'm not censoring you. I'm just uh, <laughs> making making the comment. <laughs> so that's the impact of the um, uh, carbon tax, and then that's the you know. So you know, in the future, in a couple of years' time, hopefully, hopefully, there's peace uh, in in Europe and. Um, in that area of the world, um, we may see uh, fossil fuel prices coming down. In which case, the carbon taxes might have might be required to kind of like uh, level the playing field. Yeah. Um, and I don't just... know what what you think about it, John, but for me, I you know I started out twenty years ago thinking a carbon tax was what we needed, and uh, I've just so um, like jaded from the previous twenty years of <laughs> renewable energy or climate change discussion in Australia that I almost feel like it's a dirty word, carbon tax, and um, I don't I, I never want to talk about it <laughs> anymore. Like, um... You know, like good good on you to the countries that have managed to implement this, and I, I don't want to discuss whether we should have one in Australia or the US because it's uh, it's too toxic. Uh, can I just, if I add my two cents on this, on, on a carbon tax, yeah. um, if I even if I was a right-wing government, I would prefer to have a carbon tax in there. Uh, and I'll explain why. It's just that we're talking, we need a gradual transition away from fossil fuels to, um, to renewable energy. Partially that will be done because renewable energy will be cheaper, storage is coming down in price. But the problem is, is that if you're like, like say an investment bank, how do you make that choice about which projects you fund or not? So at the moment, there's like the big banks, insurance companies, private equity, they've all signed up to these agreements where they've said, we're not going to fund coal, we're not going to fund natural gas, we're not going to fund. So you're going to see this kind of cliff edge where there's no funding. And like, I have an oil and gas background. So most oil wells will last between three to five years. You have to drill it, the oil comes up, you run out, you drill the next one. So in three to five years time, you might see this cliff edge where suddenly it's like, boom, there's no oil. Then suddenly people are going to panic and they're going to go stuff. New stuff so unfortunately, they're going to go stuff for renewables. Let's go back to, to oil and gas because people want, you know, electricity. So what a, what a carbon tax does is that it puts a price mechanism for very simple investment bankers to kind of work out where they, you know, it, it will provide like that gradual, 
um, gradual transition to to renewable energy. Anyway, that's just my two cents. So just like uh, yeah. Um, all right, let's keep uh, pushing on because we've uh, we're running ooh, out of time. Running out of time. A lot, Sorry, a lot to get through. Um, we'll have okay. you back on an, another time. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, it was just a yeah. um, quick question on offshore winds. Um, uh, you know why? You know a lot, a lot of the numbers were based on onshore uh, instead of offshore. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, here if we look at the capacity factor, Lazard had thirty-eight percent for onshore, forty-nine percent. So theoretically, you get more 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 um, electricity. Uh, sorry, you can generate sorry, more power. Sorry, forty-nine forty-nine percent capacity factor for sorry offshore. capacity for offshore. Yeah. Oh, so this is the Lazard numbers, and then uh, yeah. thirty-eight percent onshore. Um, but again, for that extra ten percent, you're paying about three times or two and a half times as much for the uh, to do the installation. On top of that, you're paying double for the um, O and M, so operations and maintenance costs. You know, you're out there on a sh you know offshore. You need a ship to go out there to change things and all that. I think listening to your po your podcast on in terms of the winds winds technology and all the um drone technology and things like that maybe those kind of costs will come down but what that means is that um according to lazard the high estimate um offshore wind is about double the price of onshore and again we're talking american numbers so potentially they might be it might be closer to closer when it comes to europe where they've been using next technology a lot more yeah, okay and it, um it's also a question about value with with offshore um so, correct yeah that's yeah in terms so of I'll, like yeah yeah, about how, how like yeah. when the electricity is generated compared to when people yep. want it and if it's at the same time as solar. But I'll yeah. do a whole video about offshore later on. So um, I won't go... Um, people asked about, you know, solar in different locations. Um, just like, you know, renewables.ninja, you can kind of play around and kind of work out the capacity factory for different different parts of the world, whether in North, Northern Hemisphere. Okay. Um, storage requirements. Uh, quickly, just the storage requirements. This is what we went through with uh, the David Osmond one. Um, one thing that uh, CSIRO did have uh, an assumption in terms of the, the, the a ratio of how much, I guess, what was the ratio of, um, so they were saying for every one kilowatt of uh, renewable energy, I think in their previous um, gen cost report, they had it as about 30 point Point three, I think it was. Um, they just released. It was just recently, like the last couple of days, they released the cons consultation paper, and they've upped that to about 0.4. So, so one kilowatt of um, uh, of renewables, you'll need about 0.4 of storage. I won't get into the details. It's quite complex modeling, and um, we're just kind of trying to keep it simple here. Okay. Do you do? That? Uh, Should we do a, a future video together on cost of storage? Because people definitely want to know, and I've left it alone because it's so complicated. But um... definitely, I think if we went through, we could do something similar with the um, the Laz. We could start off with the Lazard um, levelized cost of yeah. storage report, and then kind of work off that. Um, and I think what... um, with storage, I felt like the Lazard um, approach wasn't didn't make a whole lot of sense for for storage because they just sort of assume one specific mm -hmm. use case and um yeah all right well we'll yeah we'll tell us in the, Actually, in the comments if you would like to see a video like that and if, if a lot of people um, want it then we'll make it the the concept of storage is also going to change and that brings up a good point because for sorry that brings up an interesting um thing here because for example electric vehicles have got electric batteries sorry um, EV, uh, have got batteries now if we assume that we're going to have vehicle to grid technology and this was a question from dan harold and this had the i think the the most replies it had about 55 replies it was just <laughs> they they went nuts on this on the so they went a bit like kind of they're very enthusiastic about this topic uh, I did a simple quick calculation, 14 million, there's 14 million or close to 15 million passenger vehicles in Australia. If we assume that each of those cars is going to have a simple 30 kilowatt hour battery and we have 100% take up in the future, that's a 445 gigawatt hour battery that's available for um, balancing the grid. Now, of course, you might not have that many cars on, on and, and to give a sense of scale, that's about twice what... Um, um, what Snowy Hydro 2 can, will be able to produce. So imagine like something double the size of Snowy Hydro 2 um, would be that. So even if you assume that, you know, most of the cars, I live in the inner west, so the, most of the cars are sitting on the road, on, on, on the street doing nothing. Even if you were to say, for example, let's say 25% of the car, Twenty five percent of the cars are just sitting there plugged in. That gives us a 100 gigawatt hour battery to kind of play with. Again, um, 
you'll get lots of comments that there's not enough lithium, there's not enough cobalt, there's not enough whatever and all that. There was um, one, actually. Someone asked, <laughs> um, yeah, well, they're asking the question. Smooth, Jamie, have we got enough precious metals and rare earth elements for everyone to drive? Yeah, that's EV? another talk in, in itself and all that. Yeah. So I that's, made uh, one video um, answering that question about lithium with Alex Grant, so you can check that out. Mm. It's, oh, it was at least a year ago now, but that's a good one, and I definitely want to update that. I'm, I'm working a bit at the moment with minerals processing in Australia, so all the... Mm -hmm. mining questions sustainable mining and yeah have we got enough of everything uh ones that i want to get into more um okay yeah. but i and think the short answer to that is 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 yes if the price goes up then we will get enough maybe not in the short term though that would be my cool quick answer to smooth James's question uh and then the last and our final last question was um system cost and this was generated quite a lot of kind of like say discussion um, I just quickly, just to kind of explain what systems cost are, we're looking at say plant level, so the, the generation and Lazard kind of concentrates their costs on this plant level production costs. And while people go, well, you forgot about the grid cost, and then there's also, if you expand it further, this is um, this come from an OECD report. You know, you, you can theoretically go all the costs associated with pollution and emissions and land use changes, et cetera, et cetera. But so this one's a bit vague and complicated for accountants to kind of like calculate. But one thing I'm going to point out with grid level costs, and this is coming from, I think I pulled this out from the um, AEMC. I think it's Australian Energy. Oh, I don't know. It's one of the regulators in Australia for the Electricity Commission. Um, so if we look at, for example, here, um, your final, what people are interested in is knowing is, is that what's my final retail electricity going to cost me? So here in Australia, if we look at like for um, uh, 2021, it's close to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, if you look at the transmission costs, it only makes up two cents of that 30 cents. So the idea that transmission cost, now that's just the actual long haul, that's the transgrids, that's the long haul, you know, trans, you know, between say like the power plant and getting it into the city. Most of the cost is in distribution. So if we assume that basically distribution is gonna be the same, whether it's renewables or, or um, say, fossil fuels, that's your big one. That's basically, I think they've got it down here, is nine cents out of the 30, 30 cents. So basically a third of your costs, a third of your electricity costs is distribution, just that poles and wires outside your house. The long, long haul, even if you said like, right, we're going to have multiple solar farms and wind, which means we need multiple sets of transmissions, it's still not, I don't think it's that big a deal. It's just like, um, so that's just my little two cents worth and all that. Um, mm -hmm. And again, so that's just from the system point of view. And you can see here some other environmental policies. So that's it. That's the key numbers on um, Lazard's levelized cost of energy. Um, if you've got any, I guess if you've got any questions, I'll put this, I'll publish this and allow people to kind of like connect to the, um, it'll be free to kind of play around with and change the numbers. Um, if you've got any questions, you can contact me as well, usually through LinkedIn. Yeah, I'll leave, the them best in way the, leave them in the comments as well. Um, and yep. we'll, yeah, maybe you'll, you'll be so kind as to come look through the comments and answer some questions. Uh, I'll try to. On. I also want people to comment. We were talking about, yeah, maybe make a bit similar video on storage because I think it's just, it's, it's very complicated. Um, it's way more like LCOE is complicated, um, mm -hmm. but levelized cost of storage is way more complicated trying to figure out what you should be trying to even calculate. So um, I'm keen to have a go at that um, if you are John. And so if people sure. want to see that Definitely. and let us know. Um, and then the other thing we were talking about before we got started today was something similar for hydrogen. Um, you said that you already did some work on that. So the numbers are there. I've been keen to compare, um, well, the cost and the you know environmental impact of green hydrogen versus blue hydrogen. Um, so if people would like to see that video, then comment that and what you would like to see in it. Um, and yeah, then we should be able to get John back on and help you with the, with the video, you know, my, um, my arithmetic is pretty poor, so it's, it's very good to have somebody else doing Can the calculations. I, that, that was the, that was the genesis of, um, key numbers was that I, I, I hated doing maths, but I appreciated the benefit of maths. So, and I had a lot of old managers who used to kind of like kick me up the up the behinds because I just, you know, I'd turn up to a meeting and they just come up with some simple number and go, it's obvious why this is the number. And you'd 
you know, you run out there. So, so that's the point. So the, I'm really, I'd be, yeah, it'd be great to do the hydrogen and um, storage and I'll publish, we can publish those on key numbers as well and uh, let people play and decide what, what they, what they feel is cheap and expensive. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, we better stop now, but definitely keep writing in uh, your comments um, for things that we should do in the future. I definitely look at those comments, read most of them, even if I don't always have time to reply, but that's, um, you know, it's the best source of ideas for future videos. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention a, a few things. First, um, Fully Charged Live is coming to Australia, to Sydney in March, and I will be um, hosting some sessions there. So if you would like to come, then there is a discount code in the um, description so you can get 10% off your tickets and they're on sale now. Um, thanks again to WeatherGuard Lightning Tech for sponsoring this live stream. They also have a great tech newsletter um, that you could subscribe to and a podcast which I co-host with Alan Hall and Joel Saxon each week. Each week. The links are in the description for that and for the um, tech podcast. So we talk about all kinds of clean energy tech news and in the latest podcast episode we talk about volcanoes um, causing lightning. There was a, a big volcano recently and um, while it was erupting literally half of the lightning strikes on the planet were caused by that volcano eruption. Um, and another topic in that uh, episode is unexploded ordnance causing problems for offshore wind. So make sure to check that out on your favorite podcast app or you can watch it here on YouTube. And I need to thank, of course, John for this. This is, um, yeah, for, for being here, for helping with the video to start with. And secondly, for today, you did so much preparation. I had a shocker of a day and did very close to zero preparation for this live stream. That was my so, pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and of course, always um, thanking the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team. And if you would like to join us, then the link is in the description. Um, yeah, uh, usually I put it up on the screen, but I haven't. Oh, here it is. Yeah, there. Um, yeah, feel free to, to join us. We would love to welcome new team members. So that's all from me today. Thanks everyone for watching and Thank I'll you. see you in the next video. Bye. Bye-bye.